Grace Lutheran Church, where grace really is amazing. Uh, we are starting a new sermon series today. Uh, the sermon series is What to Do When You're Done. Uh, today we're going to talk about what to do when you're done with a friend. And for the sermon series, we're doing something a little bit different. If you've been here for a while, you know that usually we do, uh, we do a bunch of readings from the Bible, and then we usually sing a song, and then you get the sermon. Uh, we are not doing that today. We're pulling all of those Bible lessons into the sermon because we're instead of focusing on just one, we're doing a more topical thing, taking a look at what does the Bible say about this in general. And that is very, very dangerous. There's a reason that uh, I and most Welsh pastors usually focus on just one lesson because then you know you're getting God's word and you've got context and all that. When you're doing a topical, that's a little bit harder to do. But it also means it is also easier for a pastor to twist God's word. What that means for you is that, yes, I, I've studied God's word, but I want you to double check me. Those of you who get our weekly emails, you've got all those lessons in there. Take a look, read the context, make sure, and hold me to that. Make sure that what I'm saying actually does match God's word, because if I'm not preaching God's word, I am a false shepherd. I'm leading you astray. I want to make sure that I'm doing the right thing. Um, I'd like to think I am, but go ahead and double check me. That's okay. Today, we're talking about what to do when you're done with a friend. And we're going to begin with a song that says, we have a friend who is not done with us. <clears throat> Let's join together in singing what a friend we have in Jesus. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is 
not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. That means every time we fail to be patient, we sin. Every time we fail to be kind, we sin. Every time we've envied or boasted or proud or were rude, we sin. That's only the second greatest commandment. What's the first? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. As much as we fail to love our neighbor, we fail to love God even more. We are sinful in thought, word, and deed. In this time of silent confession, admit your sins to God. We confess together. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Jesus loved his Father the way we never did. He loved us the way we failed to love one another. And when he died on the cross, he took the punishment we deserve. As a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Friend of sinners, though we forsake you in our sin, you have chosen to walk with us and forgive us. Teach us to love one another as you have loved us. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus is our best, our heavenly friend. Let's join together in singing, Be Still My Soul. <clears throat>
imagine that you have a friend that you're, that you're ready to walk away from. Something has happened. Now, you were friends. You have wept together. You have bled together. You have laughed together. But something happened. And now you're done. Before we start, I need to lay down some assumptions I'm making so that we're starting at the same spot. First assumption, this person really is your friend. It is not only a work buddy. It is not only someone that happened to be in the same space as you for several years, but you never got close. This is someone that you really do care about. And as far as you know, they, they have really cared about you, that all things being equal, you would rather stay with them. You would rather be a friend with them but again, something has happened that has caused a rift in your relationship. So that's the first assumption, that this person really is a friend. The second assumption is you're willing to admit that maybe you're wrong. Maybe not about this, but just in general. That you know that if you follow your heart, you're going to end up in a bad place because you have a sinful nature. That if you just do a knee-jerk, ah, this is it, uh, you got to stop and you got to think about this because you could be wrong. So you're going to stop and you're going to consider before you end this friendship. The third thing I'm going to assume is that the Bible is more than just God's word. Now let me explain what I mean by that. First off, the Bible is God's word. It is the absolute truth. The main message of the Bible is, I am a sinner, that I am destined for hell that I was born dead in my trespasses and sins. But God loved me, and he sent his son to die for me. That, that because Jesus has died and lives again, I have a home in heaven. That is the main message of the Bible, and it is real. I really am that biggest sinner. Jesus really was born. He was really God and really human. He really died. He really rose again. I am really forgiven, and so are you. All of that is 100% true and real. I think what we forget sometimes is the Bible is not just true about spiritual things, but it speaks the absolute truth and reality about everything else that it talks about. So when it talks about friendship, we should take it as seriously as I hope you take Jesus died for your sins. All of that is true and real. So I'm going to start with that assumption. So again, we're talking about someone who really is a friend, you are willing to admit, you know what, it is possible that I'm wrong, so I'm going to stop and think about this before I end a friendship. And the Bible is a good place to go to think about, well, what should I do? Because it's absolutely true. So what do I do? If I am done with a friend, the first thing that you need to do is figure out why. So we're going to talk about a few reasons why friendships might end. And the first reason we're going to talk about is they called you out. They have told you that you are doing something wrong, and that thing needs to stop. Now, maybe they did that in a really respectful way. Maybe they pulled you aside and said, hey, man, I've heard that you're doing this. Is it right? Are you really doing that? This has to stop. It is wrong. Maybe they did it in a real jerk way. Maybe they called you out in front of friends, and they have shamed you over this. There's a lot of ways that someone can call you out but it is very possible that they called you out and that's the reason why you want to end the friendship. Well, what do you do? Shouldn't they be loyal? Shouldn't they stand with you, right or wrong? That's what a friend is supposed to do, right? Well, yeah. The Bible says that loyalty is a good thing. Yes, stand by your friends, but that is not the only thing it says about friendship. We're going to go to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is filled with lots of wisdom and lots of good daily wisdom. And there it says, better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. If you know someone that never, ever, ever tells you you're wrong, that is always good with everything you've ever done, that's actually not a friend. That's someone that doesn't care if what you're doing is going to lead to harm to you or someone else. If someone doesn't care if you're going to get hurt, that's an enemy. 
So if you expect your friend to always be with you, to always approve, you actually don't want a friend. You want an enemy. And there's something wrong with you if you want an enemy. But wounds from a friend can be trusted. Think about this. If someone calls you out on something, that means they value you more than their relationship to you. They care enough about you to say, this is something that needs to change. And I'm willing to say that even if it means the end of my friendship. That's a pretty big deal. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Rebuke means to show sharp disapproval. It is better to have a friend who is willing to say, this needs to stop, than to have an enemy say, man, you are awesome. Just keep on doing what you're doing. Proverbs uh, later on says this, perfume and incense bring joy to the heart, and the pleasantness of one's friend springs from his earnest counsel. Do not forsake your friend. Loyalty is a good thing. Do not forsake your friend and the friend of your father. And don't go to your brother's house when disaster strikes you. Better a neighbor nearby than a brother far away. So yeah, the pleasantness of your friend is from their counsel. From them saying and pulling you aside and saying, there's got to be a better way. So what do you do if you're done with a friend because they've called you out? Step one, don't walk away. Your sinful nature will hate anyone who says, this needs to stop. Don't follow your heart. Because your sinful nature lives there. That is not who you are. You are a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. But you've got a sinful nature that's very tricky. If you follow your heart when someone calls you out, it's probably going to end the friendship. So instead, just stop. Remember that assumption? I'm willing to admit that I could be wrong. It's really important here. We started with a confession of sins. If I take that seriously, I'm willing to admit, if a friend pulls me aside, maybe that person's right. Step one, don't walk away. Just wait. Step two, repent, asterisk. <laughs> See, I can be wrong. I'm sinful. I admit that. That friend could be seeing something that I don't see. Or that friend may be willing to warn me when I think it's not a big deal. That friend can say, no, this is a big deal. But you know that friend, unless that friend is Jesus, that friend could be wrong. Maybe that friend is telling me something that is not correct. Which means I need someone that is objective. I need someone that is not me or my friend to tell me whether or not something is right or wrong. And you know where you do that? I got this Bible thing here. I got this Bible. This is God's word. It is true. Remember, that was one of the assumptions. I want to go here and see what God says about what I'm doing. What does God say? And it's very, 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 very possible that I am sinning. In which case, then, I need to repent. I need to admit I have done wrong. I need to admit I am sinning in this case. Please forgive me. But maybe my friend is wrong, and they're calling me out on something that is not wrong. Okay, well, hold that thought. We're going to talk about that in a minute. That's why that asterisk is there. So yeah, don't walk away. Repent if that person is actually calling you out on a sin. Absolutely repent. Step three, then ask, how can you best love this person? We have a natural tendency to say, but my feelings got hurt. We don't usually phrase it that way. But, oh, you're supposed to be loyal. How dare you call me out? That's it. That person's such a jerk. My focus is on me and my feelings. If I'm ready to be done with a friend, instead, how can I best show love to this person that has called me out? Who is that? It is the best way to show love to that person to apologize to them and reconcile? Then do that. Maybe that person has called me out on a sin, and I realize that in my sin, I'm enabling their sin. Maybe it's two drunks, and one of them says, you got to clean up, and I realize I'm that drunk, and I'm enabling his drunkenness. 
So the best way to love that person is to put in some boundaries and get away. Because I love that person. Which means you could end up in different places here. But the focus is, how can I love that person? Not, how can I deal with my wounded pride? How can I love that person? This is what you do when you're done with a friend if they're calling you out on something. Don't walk away, repent, asterisk. How can you best love this person? But you know that it's not always about someone calling you out. Sometimes you just get into an argument. And sometimes the argument is really dumb. Let me give you an example. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. So Proverbs was written roughly 900 BC. We've now jumped to about 50 AD. Paul has, has finished his first great missionary journey. He and his friend Barnabas planted a whole bunch of churches. It's been a couple of years now. And Paul says, hey, let's go back and see how they're doing. And he grabs the original missionary team. We got Barnabas here. Let's go. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul didn't think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and not continued with them in the work. So part of the original missionary team was this guy named Mark. And Mark apparently did not make it all the way through. We don't know why, but he left them. Did he get overwhelmed and just couldn't handle it? Did he get distracted and sinfully left them? We're not told. We don't know. But Barnabas says, hey, let's get the whole missionary team back. Let's take Mark. And Paul goes, yeah, I don't think that'd be a good idea. He abandoned us last time. I love the phrasing. Paul did not think it wise. This was not a matter of sin. Paul did not say, Barnabas, you idiot, this breaks the 67th commandment. And Barnabas did not answer by saying, Paul, stop being a stubborn German, because he wasn't. But they start arguing. And it's not over a matter of sin. It's a matter of, what's the best thing to do here? They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. They walked away from each other. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. The argument was so big that they were done with one another. Barnabas takes Mark and he heads south. Paul takes another friend, a guy by the name of Silas, and he heads north. And that starts Paul's second great missionary journey. So what do we get out of this? If you're having an argument with a friend and it's threatening to end the friendship, figure out what the argument's about. What are you actually arguing about? I think most of us have seen enough television shows to know that what you're arguing about is not necessarily what the argument is actually about. I think of a lot of great 90s sitcoms, uh, Boy Meets World, where the two people would be arguing and then you'd find out, you always do this! And you thought it was about this one thing, but you find out it's actually this been long, simmering thing. Start by being humble enough to ask questions. What is going on here? Not in a confrontation, confrontational way. What's going on here? No, okay, please don't do that. But be willing and humble enough to sit and listen. What's going on? What are we actually arguing about? Love the person enough to ask and listen. And then, repent, asterisk. Wait a second, I thought we weren't arguing about something that was sinful. That was the last one. Correct. But maybe you have noticed that sometimes you might be arguing over something that's not a matter of sin, but the way you argue ends up becoming sinful. It is not sinful to cheer for the Vikings. I know some of you might have issues with that. So it is not sinful to cheer for the Vikings. You're breaking no commandments if you cheer for the Vikings. It's also not sinful to cheer for the Packers or the Steelers or the Browns. Take your pick. And yet, I think you probably know someone that can be a real jerk about who they cheer for. They might get in your face. They might celebrate a little bit too hard. Or if you, if you happen to beat their team, maybe they get to be real jerks. Who you cheer for, case in point, <laughs> who you cheer for 
doesn't matter. How you cheer for them could be. And what you find, when you figure out what the argument's about, you may find that you have been sinning about something that's not sinful by itself, just in how you're approaching it. And so you need to repent. And one of the things you need to repent of is saying my preference is more important than your friendship. If my preference is more important than your friendship, how selfish am I? Can you imagine someone breaking up a friendship because I like Taco Bell and you don't? It would be a real dumb reason to break up a friendship, right? But I say, you know what? When I'm with you, you don't like Taco Bell, so we don't eat at Taco Bell. We go to Arby's. That's fine. I'll eat Taco Bell when I'm not with you. Because it's not sinful to like Taco Bell, probably, I think, pretty sure. <laughs> but I'll do that without you, because I value your friendship more than I value my preference. And if I valued my preference more, I'm sinning. I'm not showing love. So I may need to repent, even if we're arguing over something that isn't sinful. So yeah, first, figure out what the argument's about. Second, repent, asterisk, because maybe you're not sinning here. Maybe you have nothing to repent of. But either way, step three, ask, how can you best love the person? How can I love you? The focus is not on my hurt feelings. The focus is not on my football team or my Taco Bell or whatever it is the argument's over. How can I best love you? Maybe that's reconciliation. Maybe that's me saying, I'm sorry, I was a jerk. Please forgive me. Maybe it's figuring out what I'm doing differently. Maybe it's separation. Maybe it's boundaries. Maybe I realize, you know what? I love the Vikings. You love the Packers. We probably shouldn't watch the same football team together or the same game together because we start talking smack and it gets really heated. I still love you. So I'm going to separate for that. And maybe we'll just go golfing together because that's better. I don't know. But I'm going to ask, what's the best way to love this person? Now, I use Paul and Barnabas as an example. Paul really didn't trust Mark. said, no, this person should not come with. One of the last things that Paul wrote, or the last thing we have that he wrote, is the book of 2 Timothy. And right at the end of that letter, he says, get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. How crazy is that? That he goes from, no, no, he can't come with, I don't trust him, to get him and bring him here because I need him. That's someone who says, I care about this person and this is the best thing to do right now. Now, that does not cover every simple, single example of why a friendship might break up. But I think it covers two things. Arguments over things that aren't sinful and someone calling you out. Those are two big reasons why friendships fall apart. As I went through that, I want you to consider, have you done it? Think about the past. <coughs> when I was in college, I was involved in something that was indeed sinful. Two of my friends pulled me aside and said, Luke, we heard that this is a thing going on. Is it true? I said, well, it is. And they, told me, and they told me this has to stop. And it ruined the friendship. To this day, I don't know where one of those friends is. It's been decades since we've talked. To this day, one of those friends, we're friends on Facebook and Instagram. We will like each other's stuff. But we haven't had spoken five words to each other since college graduation. Notice how I phrased that before. I admit now that was sinful. I've repented of that. And I did repent before the end of college. But I considered my sin at that time more important than that friendship. I didn't do this. And maybe you see yourself in that, where you valued your sin more than you valued a friendship. Or maybe you look at your life and you say, yeah, I called out a friend, but I did it in a real jerk way. I sinned when I called them out in how I did it. Or maybe you look at your life and you say, I know a friend who's doing something wrong, but I never called them out. I guess I care more about our friendship than I care about the friend. Or maybe you look and you say, I have been a jerk because I've let my preferences be more important than a friendship. 
the truth is, if you look at my sin, I should not have friends. I shouldn't. I want to go to one more Bible verse, or a chunk of verses. It's from the book of John, and it's one of the last things Jesus said before he died. It is from the night before he died. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I've loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You're my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I've made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that'll last. Then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. Jesus looked at you and he asked, what is the best way to love you? He didn't walk away. Instead, he walked toward you in all your mess. And he said, I'm going to lay down my life for you because that is the best way to love you. And I will take your sins away because that is the best way to love you. And I'm going to call you out on your sins because I still love you. And when you sin, I forgive you because I love you. Because I choose you to be my friend. That's what Jesus has done. He is the friend that we need. We've sung it several times already today. What a friend we have in Jesus. Jesus is our best, our heavenly friend. He's what we need. And what happens as you get to know him better and as you get to be tighter friends, not that he can be closer to you, but that you can be closer to him, you'll start loving your friends better. You'll get the courage to call them out in a loving way. You'll be able to open up your ears and fight your sinful nature better so that when they call you out, you can say, let's check what the Bible says. You're right, I'm sinning, please forgive me. That when it comes to arguments, you can set your preferences aside because friendship is more important than than preferences. You're going to ask, how can I best love this person? What do you do when you're done with a friend? Let me sum it up in one sentence. How can you best love the person? That may mean boundaries. That may mean reconciliation. That may mean repentance on your part. That may mean repentance on their part. But you're always going back to this. How can I best love that person? It's not about me and my feelings. It's about how can I love them best? Amen. Let's stand. <laughs> and now the peace of God that is better than anything we can understand will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord until he comes home to bring us home to life everlasting. Amen. We're going to speak a summary of, what God, of who God is and what he's done for us. Today we're going to use the words of the Apostles Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We have a chance to thank Jesus for being our friend. One of the ways we do that is by gathering an offering. We've got a plate in the back. Feel free to make use of that if you want. If you like giving electronically, uh, let me know, and I'll hook you up with the people who know how to do that, because that's not me. If you're our guest, don't feel any obligation to give. This is just one of the ways that we say thank you here.
For now, let's continue with the prayer of the church. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you chose to be our friend, and for that we thank and praise you. But it's not enough for you to be our friend. You also give us friends here in this world. Help us to be good friends to one another. Help us to love one another as you would have us love one another. Encourage us and help us to encourage one another. We ask that you be with the friendless. Open up our eyes for opportunities to reach out and love those who don't have friends. If that's us, comfort us in our isolation. Help us figure out if there's anything we can do. And as it's your will, send us friends. Be with those who are lonely. Love them and encourage them and let them know no matter what, they are united with you through the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask that you be in this war-torn world. There is so much brokenness and there is so much hatred. As it is your will, send healing. Help us to be people of peace wherever we are. Lord, be with those who are sick and suffering. We ask especially that you be with Finn Bader and his family. As it appears, Finn is going to be called home to you soon. Love them dearly. If it's your will to send healing, send that. Do whatever you think is best, Lord, and we trust that you do know what's best. Father, hear us as we bring you our private prayers. Now, take all that we are and all that we have and use it to your glory. Amen. And as you taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
instruction of the ushers. The feast is ready.
of the table of the Lord. Take and eat. This is the body of our Lord. Let's stand.
hymn is from the new hymnal that we don't have here yet. Uh, I got to use it uh, during our Lent rotation when I was visiting other churches, and I said, yeah, this, this is one that we need to sing here. So that's why you won't find it in the hymnals we have out there, because it's not in that one, but uh, it is in the new one. Uh, we'll get the chance to sing that a few more times with this sermon series. I don't have any other announcements, so the Lord be with you till we meet again. Thank you.